Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 381, featuring part two of my interview with the fabulous Bob Clarty. In this part of the interview, we talk about his uh, game Odyssey, the complete adventure. Uh, we talk also about his Atlantis game. Uh, we talk in general about the importance of game testing, how to deal with feedback from fans or uh, critics of your games, and much, much more. I think there's a lot here uh, that you'll enjoy. So uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Bob Clarty. Do you have something else you wanted to say about the mule? Uh, no, not really. Uh, that was, there were, uh, I didn't consider any of those things to be that innovative myself. They, it turned out some of them were because there were still people doing, uh, simpler games. I was always trying to do Dungeons and Dragons and, uh, every time there was a hardware improvement, anytime I had a little more space or a little more, uh, resolution or more colors or something that would let it be a better game, um, I'd write another one and try to try to make the you know the full experience i was never quite satisfied with it the other problem that, that caused of course was that uh it was never a pure role-playing game it was never a pure adventure game sometimes it was a war game so you know I, yeah. it, it never fit a standard genre and i think to some extent i mean that was the kind of game i liked i wanted a complete fantasy uh story experience and uh the games that were really doing better in the marketplace were ones that specialized, you know, a strategy game or a, a, a straight adventure game. Those, those tended to do better. Um, may have been me, but uh, I think it was basically not having a style of game that could easily be pinned down to, uh, to a fan base. Yeah, that probably comes down to the way these things are marketed to, right? And Absolutely. An easily definable niche, I guess. And, and the proper buzzwords that the, buzzwords, that, yeah. that the buyer's looking for. Yeah. I was never never good at marketing or sales. So uh, uh, I, I wrote the kind of game I wanted to play. And that was, but I never played them. Uh, whenever never, I saw. Never played ne them. <laughs> no, not really. Never played your own games or never played any of the other ones? Both. Uh, I mean, I played with them. I, I, would, I would run the games and, and observe them. And I, and I enjoyed the process, but it wasn't what their writer had in mind. The writer had in mind that you're supposed to immerse yourself in his story or his adventure. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at how did he do that? Or I, how could I incorporate that into my own games? And I spent more time studying the games than I did uh, just playing them. Oh, yeah. You mentioned you had always been the dungeon master in all those Dungeons and yeah. Dragons games. I mean, you, you seem like you kind of had a dungeon master mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah. And I'd rather run the game, design the game than, than, than just play as part of it. So why do you think that is? Oh, because I'm a game maker. You know, there were, there were other games I did enjoy thoroughly. Uh, you know, the games that I didn't write games that I, uh, genres that I, I did the first person shooters when they first came out, I'd never done anything like that. I could play those. Those were, those were a lot of fun for me. Uh, some of the puzzle games, like um, Fool's Errand is one that we did early on. We did a port, and uh, it was, I, I enjoyed that game completely because I've never done a game like that. So I didn't need to study it, and I didn't get distracted with uh, techniques and, and um, processes. Instead, I could just enjoy the experience. So, but but games like mine, if it, if it looked like mine, then it was part of, I don't want to call it work. You couldn't yeah. take your developer glasses off long enough to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know, it, it wasn't work. It was, it was what I found fun. But it was the process of how to create it was what was fun more so than than the experience of playing it. I want to ask you before uh, before we get into Odyssey. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? What did you think about the the competition that was out? Uh, I guess you had the wizardry was out about this time. Uh, I don't know if Ultima One was out, but I don't know if you saw Calabeth. <laughs> I, I, Lord I, I, was a, I was aware of these things, and uh, and I looked at them, but I didn't play them, and I, I wasn't. Um, Temple of Apshai, I think was. Yeah, Temple of Apshai was an early one. Um, I, I wasn't a uh, how to put it. Um, I, I wasn't really a groupie. I didn't really study the the other authors and follow their works and and just check where they're going to go and see if I could meet them. I just really was oblivious, kind of. 
I mean, I was vaguely aware of these people and, and their works, and, and I was, at, frankly, very admiring of the ones that were very successful because they typically, many of them were doing way better than me. And I, uh, but I didn't really care enough to <laughs> follow them, you know? I, I, yeah. I was more, you know, I, I was more interested in programmers around me, people I could meet that I could work with. I, you know, I had a, a local community that I was kind of focused on. And it made me, um, uh, in that regard, I was kind of an outsider to the industry that I, I didn't get to know some of these peers at the time uh, until, you know, we actually worked together for some reason. Uh, some of them I met, like Ken Williams became a friend, but uh, it was Dr. Cat at some point. <laughs> I did. I did. And uh, so, you know, a handful of them. And I, I occasionally went to, to um, parties or gatherings and met a few, but um, I didn't get to know these people well. I'm not as uh, social a person as it takes to, you know, break the barriers of fandom. You know, there's, the, you know, the people, the people that are good at this have some kind of uh, hesitancy about being close to the first person that comes up to them, and that's that's just an automatic reaction they have to dealing with fans. And uh, I'm not pushy enough to get past that, so I just kind of watch or listen or occasionally have a chat, but I never got very close to any of them. I regret that. I had an opportunity, you know, early days, but um, just wasn't what I was doing in the industry at the time. I think that's how I would be. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever go to any of uh, John Romero's Apple II reunion? I went to one of them, uh, 98, I think, the one in Dallas in, uh, when he was with I, – his, the company was called IDOS, I think. Uh, oh, Ion Storm was his company. Yeah, Ion Storm publisher. Ion Storm, yeah, and uh, that was way cool. But again, I I, I felt like an outsider there. Uh, John was a, and is a terrific uh, fan of the industry and the people, and he knows everybody and uh, keeps track of what they're doing. And uh, I greatly admire his abilities in that regard, and as a game maker too. You know, he's just good at all of it. But uh, so it was a lot of fun to go to that and, and meet some of the people there. Um, I met Nasser Gabelli there. That was fun. He was yeah, well, that's had, John Romero's big hero. It it is, and uh, we had uh, <clears throat> we had worked with him. Well, actually, we had published Synergistic Software. Had published three of his games early on before they uh, got Serious Software started as a hmm. publisher. So I knew him. I knew him long distance from the earliest days, and he was terrific to work with. But. Uh, I don't know who else was at that the show. I, I, I have to go look it up. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, I, again, I felt like an outsider there. I, I, I was uh, delighted to see it, you know, to see all these celebrities there. And I didn't consider myself one of them. You know, I was just, wow, hey, hey they let me in the door. This is cool. I it seems like you're a pretty humble guy, Bob. <laughs> uh, I guess. Whatever, whatever it is, I, I, don't, I don't have the mentality it takes to, uh, <laughs> to don't stand Don't you know who I am? <laughs> No, not me. Sorry. <clears throat> well, let's uh, jump into the uh, Odyssey, the complete adventure. I think the uh, spelling is off because it's actually C O M P L E A T. Is that right? The... Oh, right. Oh, yeah. I forgot uh, about that. Complete. What was up with the spelling? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. It, there were there were several things going on there. One was the the attempt to look old English, and you know that was. Oh, okay. yeah, and I was more often than not, it was. Uh, I, I got letters of correction from grammar Nazis <laughs> thought I was corrupting their children or something. But the worst one was the app venture. Nobody caught that as I, to me, it was Apple adventure. I was concatenating right. words. And, uh, the, the APPLE user group had a lot of products like that. There was an app mail and an app writer and app this, that, and the other. So like I, 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 I app or whatever nowadays. Yeah. So I was going to do app ventures. And again, I got people that would, Inform me politely that I had misspellings <laughs> that I need to crown. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't the best jo joke in the around I guess. But anyway, no uh, Odyssey though was uh, again this was uh, shortly after the Apple disk drive came out, and uh, uh, all of our games moved over to diskette, and it was so much easier to do manufacturing, and it was a little bit more reliable. Everything was faster, and that was really cool. But the biggest thing was. I had more storage space available, and I could you could put it was fast enough now that you could put games out on disk. And as you crossed some barrier, as you got off the island, 
it could load another program and it, and it wasn't uh, such a dreary delay that it interrupted gameplay. So we could write much, much bigger games. So um, <clears throat> Odyssey was the first attempt to do a game that took a whole disc instead of instead of just filling up the Apple's memory, we were going to fill up the Apple's diskette. And uh, that wasn't the goal. It never, it never was exactly the goal to use up all the space. The goal was to make a bigger game. And hey, we have more space to work with, so uh, I can do more stuff. And you kept doing more stuff until you ran out of space, and that's when you had to stop until the next technology you know, improvement came along. So in this case, it was disk space. And there were, uh, I think there were three or four, three programs at least involved in that. Uh, it kind of started out like Wilderness did. In Wilderness, you kind of conquered an island. On Odyssey, you used your first island to build a force that could afford to buy a ship and head out to sea. And, and the, ex the uh, adventure expanded to a larger realm. And uh, so there was a, an at sea program. Um, as you landed on different islands, you would then you know, explore caverns and uh, ruins and temples and stuff. And so there was a, another program for that. And I think there was a there was even a separate program for the finale when you got to the final island uh, and all the special there were unique puzzles there at the final island that were uh, you, you weren't found anywhere else. So that was uh, yeah, it was our first attempt at a big game. Well, it was it was the complete. <laughs> it was complete. <laughs> until they gave us a little more space later. And then we oh. then we were beyond complete. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's a tremendously ambitious. I mean. Even by modern standards, I would think, with all of these uh, three very basically three parts to this game, right? Or maybe even four. Four animation just... and sound effects. Mm -hmm. All this and uh, still working in integer basic at this point, right? It was uh, the Apple II Plus came out with Apple Soft Basic, and so we we were writing everything in both integer and Apple Soft at that time. So you, you could get an AppleSoft version. What we sold was the integer version because that would work on any computer. If, if I mean, the, the other version was available if anybody asked for it because it, it had some improvements. Um, but it's, you know, there were still too many Apple IIs out there and we wanted to run on both machines. And so until backwards, everybody... Backwards compatible, in other words. Ab absolutely. So, so we still offered the integer versions of everything as much as we could. This was set oh. in the. Well, this was set in the Hyborian age. I guess that's a Conan. It was, uh, yeah. That was uh, a, a lot of the Conan mythology. Little bits of it were in there. Yeah, you, you're a big fan of Conan in general, right? I am. I was. You know, I. I Not I was looking, <laughs> I know. Well, yes and no. I still like. I still like the myth. I still like the the hero, but. Those stories are really, really, really dated. Uh, I hadn't realized he was uh, Robert Howard was writing in the '30s, and uh, boy, they you know looking back at those stories, I I don't. I, I was a fan in my teens. Uh, I can't read them now, but well, too simplistic or what? Too yeah, uh, and uh, you know there were there was inherent racism in them. There was you know some bigotry that was oh yeah. There was some sexism that was so obvious. I, women were just objects in, in those books. I, I was oblivious at the time, but it was part of, you know, early fantasy writing. It's just those things were taken for granted. Now they're kind of offensive. Yeah, I really noticed that. I've been reading the original James Bond novels by Fleming. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, they would never oh, fly today. Oh, man. Yeah, no, no. no. Could, could. <laughs> I just was shocked. You know, I had... Mm. It was a different time. That's an excuse. It was the focus in, in that in that one in particular. The focus was on the hero, that one guy, and everything around him was perhaps, uh, you know, there's a lot of evil, a lot of, you know, bad people, a lot of bad attitudes. But you can always presume that okay, this hero, the one that I'm identifying with, he's really a good guy. All I right. can I tolerate that. But yeah, the books were kind of full of a lot of crap. It was it was a different time. Doesn't excuse it though. It's just okay. It's past its time. But no, I was a long time fan, and I uh, I used a lot of the Conan mythology and um, the early. There were a lot of other writers from those days that I kind of borrowed from that, uh, you know, from my teen days that that 
you know, got some of the vocabulary of the, there was a, the, the following game. I don't know if we were going to include Atlantis in this discussion, but uh, after Odyssey, I did a game about Atlantis and there were uh, any number of, you know, there were ornithopters in that. And I don't know who came up with that term and I, or who I stole it from. It certainly wasn't original to me, but there were lots of things out of those. I don't, I don't remember. I'll have to look it up one of these days. But oh, is that the Dying Earth guy? Is it Vance? Jack Vance with the ornithopter? Could be. I definitely read Vance. I remember <laughs> the name. Yeah. I, I'd have to go look. Uh, anyway, it was... Uh, but, you know, that was, you know, that was part of the, you know, the fantasy universe of the time with, you know, these, these terms that Lovecraft used or Howard or uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I, you know, anybody that had some fantasy or science fiction content, I borrowed from he- as heavily as I could. Those were the people I was reading. So it seems like back then it wasn't really frowned upon to take from other things. I mean, think of all the, I think about all the games that have Star Trek references all through them if not the actual shapes of the ships and <laughs> yeah you know, the, 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 the tolkien i mean my goodness the, you know people copied a lot from that uh, but yeah. it, it just probably wasn't a lot of pressure to do something totally original right i mean it, uh, yeah. concerns about ip in other words weren't really there uh, yes and no yes and no there were there were things that you couldn't do like i didn't use the word conan <laughs> You know, the name Conan without a license, you know, years later, I got a license. Same thing with the Lord of the Rings stuff. You know, when we actually did a Lord of the Rings game, we had a very strict list of what were what names we could use in the game. And Oh, really? Yeah. You know, we, you could use the main characters, but there were things in the Silmarillion that we weren't supposed to touch because somebody else had a license that included that first first cut on that. So we were told, stay away from that part. OK, fine. We had plenty to work with. But you know there there were so but there were things that you can you things that were more generic like for instance referring to the Hyborian age particularly in the Robert Howard universe um, at the time he was long dead and nobody w- had done a movie yet so at the time I was I was writing uh, nobody cared about that it was considered public domain we were aware of those things uh, even then we were aware of what was considered public domain now it was a little vaguer than it is now now rights get tied up a lot tighter than, than back in the eighties. But, uh, there were things you weren't allowed to do and we were very cautious about that. So not everybody was. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I've actually worked with Scorpia uh, pretty recently. So I don't know if she's still doing her thing, but uh, I ran across some reviews that she did of your games of uh, Odyssey. Uh-huh. She called it one of the finest of the early CRPGs. So the, I guess and this one was pretty successful. This was probably your most successful game to date, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. And you know, again, back in those days, success was uh, a way different story, you know, metric than it is now. Um, I don't remember the numbers, but it could not have been more than. I mean, I, I, probably the best-selling game that Synergistic ever published was about twenty thousand units, and it was. Those are pathetic numbers by you know, any later standards, but, you know, we got out of publishing, um, about the time things were really taking off, you know, the, the, uh, Atari was one of the first companies that had really big numbers and they kind of drove the expectations for, uh, you know, what a good game was, you know, by the time I worked with Sierra, if a a game wasn't selling at least a hundred thousand units, it wasn't, wasn't successful enough wow. to bother with the sequel. So I mean, Synergistic never had numbers like that. So it was uh, it was way different. Now again, I don't know how some of the better selling, you know, Ultima was probably doing better than us, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know some of the other. Uh, oh, he ended up with Sierra too, right? We did. Or yeah, he that did, was or uh, uh, Garriott. Uh, Ultima 2, I think. Wasn't that uh, published by Sierra? Yeah. Sierra got involved with lots of lots of companies in its final couple of years. Yeah, I didn't I didn't learn until late in the process that um, I mean, the, the reason I got involved was almost casual. Ken Williams moved the company up to our area. Uh, he, he had started in Course Gold, California and been there forever. And then they moved up to into Bellevue, Washington, which is very near where I live. And 
we got to know each other, and we've been working together remotely for a while anyway. Uh, but anyway, the, you know, I, I thought of it as being kind of a casual. Um, gradually, we just worked more and more and more with Sierra because they wanted lots of stuff, and it was I hated sell, you know, landing jobs. I hated going out and, and finding a contract. So, and he was just down the street. So, and a nice guy, a pleasant person. But I didn't realize that at that time he was. Uh, actively recruiting every developer he could, you know, set up, you know, connections with and uh, trying to become a bigger and bigger publisher so that he could sell Sierra. And that was the goal. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was, it was kind of cool. A lot of us, a lot of different developing company, development companies were joining with Sierra at that time. It was interesting when we got together. <clears throat> now, before we move on, uh, I, I, I got over at the CRPG addict. Uh, mm. <laughs> there was a comment about this this game. I just wanted to run it by you and, and see what you thought about this. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so he says the navigation in the sea. Talk, this is talking about uh, uh, Odyssey. The navigation in the sea is the most annoying interface I have ever <laughs> experienced in the CRPG. Uh huh. And he goes on, you know. But do you think that's fair, or is that is he? Uh, is he exaggerating? This? Uh, oh, it might be fair, but he also perhaps is not aware of um, how the sea worked. Um, the thing is, okay, what he's referring to is that you couldn't really necessarily control where you were going that well because the winds blew and you went where the winds blew, and they and sometimes you'd be becalmed and you're just stuck there. The thing is that. Uh, the, the, that part of the game was kind of tuned so that there were different things going on. You got becalmed. That was a problem. You were attacked by sea serpents. That was a problem. You'd see an island in the distance. You couldn't necessarily get there because it didn't really matter which islands you went to. And, uh, okay, the wind's blowing west. Go to the island of the west because it's once you get to an island, we're going to generate a random uh, uh, ruin and it doesn't matter which island you go to, you're going to get a random ruin. So why get attached to any particular island? That was my theory. <laughs> now, there are, there are other players that want to have more control than that. And, yeah, I, I really ticked them off because they didn't have a lot of control. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was meant to be a different kind of game experience. than the, you know, when, when you're on the island, I wanted the, the game play to be very different from playing on an island where you... You walk in a certain direction, and you reach your goal, and you know where you're going, and you get there. No, this was supposed to be different, and uh, no, people didn't take that as, as being what they wanted to do. <laughs> well, it's That's pretty realistic, right? I mean, it, it was the sailing yeah, yeah. back then so dangerous, and and it was uh, well, also, and uh, to the, the 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 great explorers, you know, the original explorers had no idea where they were going and what they would find. And that was the experience I was trying to mimic. But again, that not everybody's an explorer. Some people uh, are travelers. They want to get to their destination and uh, pissed off when they, you know, have a, a delay. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can understand his complaint. He was right for him. <laughs> well, you mentioned already I've App Venture to Atlantis. So I guess the game is, I guess the 20,000 cells were enough, right, to justify the uh, the sequel in this case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of these were doing well enough. I mean, uh -huh. at that time, uh, we the middlemen weren't um, very well established, and so the publisher got most of the the revenue, and we were really a small company. Um, th those kind of numbers were quite enough to sustain, you know, seven or eight people, which was all we had in our office. Um, I think by that time... I was out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> we, so you've been we in the were, basement all this time. Well, well, um, yeah, through um, Dungeon Wilderness and part of Odyssey. I think it was, may have been, I'm, I'm, I have to check the dates. But, yeah, we started in the family basement. And it was, uh, I had, uh, my wife did finally quit her accounting job and become a synergistic partner. And she ran our books and she did my, you know, did the manufacturing and did some of the customer support and, I see she gets a lot of credit on these games. Oh, yeah. Well, she was a full partner. She was an active act. She did not program, but she did everything else. And she was way better tester than me. So, And then she coordinated the other testers. So she did a lot of stuff. 
But we were very, very small, and we stayed in the basement as long as I could. And uh, only when we had, I think our first employee came and worked in my basement. Um, but it was after the second employee that we decided we needed a real office. <laughs> but again, it was cheap in those days. We were very small. You know, you didn't go start out by hiring, you know, 15 people. And that, that just wasn't, wasn't the way you started. It wasn't the way I started anyway. Yeah. It was a different world. Well, Chen had mentioned talking about this uh, app venture to Atlantis. He had a question that he asked. He wasn't sure about it. And I just thought I'd run it past you, too. Uh, so I guess at the start of the game, there's an orb uh, that, oh, yeah. you, that you need to finish the game. And he was wondering, did, did anyone actually forget to get the orb, I guess, and get all the way to the end of the game and, <laughs> and not be able to complete it? And I, I just wondered, did you get mail or did you hear about that happening? I, I'm i sure it happened. I No, I don't remember getting such complaints. I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I got a lot of mail, and I read it all, and I responded to a lot of it, and it made a big... It had a big impact on me. Uh, I, yeah, it did because you know these are the people that are playing your games, and you have your own idea about how they're going to play it and how they're going to react to it. And when you find out that no, this really ticked people off, okay, you know, change the design. The, the the goal of a good dungeon master is to keep the players happy. You want them to play and play and come back and play again, so you can keep doing what you like to do, writing new games. So, yeah, keeping players happy was very important to me. And it was, you know, being uh, being involved in the in the customer support uh, early on was was a critical thing for me to, you know, it was part of why I, uh, you know, my my son, um, I'm an adult son who's uh, in the in the computer industry at the moment, and you know, every place he's worked, there's this hostility between developers and testers really? that. Yeah, well, where he's worked anyway. And, you know, they, they eventually learned to get along, but basically uh, uh, new developers tend to resent testers because they criticize you. They tell you your work is wrong or flawed or broken or whatever. And it, uh, who, new, would, who wouldn't like that? You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, boy, programmers don't like to be told that kind of stuff. But they learn. You know, the good ones learn. But, again, I didn't have that problem because I'd been doing customer support. So I had... Uh, a tremendous respect for testers because they kept pissed off customers from happening. You know, once you got a pissed off customer, gee, uh, the product's out there. And, you know, am I going to pull back all those copies and fix the complaint and then reissue them? That's, you know, that's like, impractical. So to me, you know, beating the complaint by having good testing done early was really always important to me. And it was because of that early customer support work I'd done. I'd done. I've always done that. I've uh, even the, the last programming I did, I was one of the support people for it. I just, it's something I've always, I always like to have a connection with the people using the software and what they do and don't like. So it seems like a healthy well, attitude to me. I mean, I guess nowadays you know, I, they just slap uh, early access on it and put it out there, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, I guess. You know, I, I, I know it's done differently elsewhere. I, I, I'm well aware of that, but I just can't see it. I, I don't know how you could be that way. It's you got to care about the customers more than anything. Well, what do you remember some of these letters? I mean, what was one that really sort of made you stop and think and make big changes? <laughs> I mean, what? The, the the most obvious one I've already touched on a little bit. Um, I had a, a letter that uh, a mother helped her two 12-year-old son, well, a 12-year-old son and his 12-year-old friend wrote me a letter complaining about, uh, okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Uh, in in uh, several of these games, Wilderness Campaign, for sure, Odyssey, probably, both of them had instances where you would uh, negotiate with a merchant to get, and, and you could, you could, Barter haggling thing, right? haggling, haggling, and and I wanted haggling to be part of the game. And if you were too rude in your haggling, they'd get pissed off and tell you to go away, and you just lose a chance. Now you'd have to go find another merchant. You wasted time, but you always had an opportunity to do one or two counter offers before they'd get pissed off. So what I had in mind is, okay, he he says a hundred, I would counter eighty, you know, and we we dicker down and end up buying it for ninety three, and everybody's happy. So that was my intent. What these 12-year-old kids were doing was the, the merchant would say 100, and they'd say minus 500. And, 
and, and he didn't get pissed off the first time you insulted him. It's like second or third time. They figured this out. They, they figured out the AI I was using. So, uh, but, so he would counter with something between these two extremes. So he'd counter with negative 200. And they'd say, okay. And he'd sell <laughs> it to them and give them 200 in gold. Oh, so wow. they got a tremendous amount of gold. Now, this is back in the energy basic days. They, they were one of the first ones that blew up the program because when they got over 32767 in gold, it crashed. And I got complaint letters written by their mother <laughs> who explained <laughs> how stupid I was. You know, it actually, oh. she, didn't, she was very polite. She was very polite. But she said, hey, they figured out the AI. They figured out, she didn't call it that, but I know what she was talking about. Uh, they figured out how to outsmart this thing and it causes your game to crash. And yeah, that was, uh, that was when I realized that you needed testers besides the writers. You know, the, it couldn't be me doing the testing. It couldn't be any programmer testing his own work because uh, you don't anticipate how people will either outsmart you or abuse your intent, you know, and uh, yeah, who would have thought to put in a negative number? I, I wouldn't have never thought, you know, I, I'll tell you the, the other thing that came out of that was I, I mentioned my adult son who's in the computer industry. Uh, that same son back when he was five years old, he started working for synergistic as a tester. He was great as a, as a five-year-old tester, cause he, he never did what we intended, <laughs> but, uh, and that was good, you know, okay. He's trying things we hadn't thought of. He found things that, um, nobody else found. He couldn't communicate them. Well, you know, I, I get these test reports from him that were little pictures and Aww. made up words and stuff. And I, it was, we'd have to go ask him to show us, but yeah, he found some good stuff. He was a good tester, but it was, it was a, uh, as you say, it's, uh, uh, experienced gamers know how they're supposed to play the game and, and they're predictable. It's the inexperienced gamers that you've got to also deal with and because we're teaching them how to be gamers. So you got to make the game fun for them too. You know, until they get the idea of how you want them to react or how you expect them to react in any case. You don't want, I don't want them to do anything in particular, but I expect certain behavior. Yes, offering ne negative 500 gold, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, there's somebody out there that will. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. She'll be back next week with uh, part three <laughs> interview with Mr. Clardy. A lot of great stuff uh, coming up, including his uh, Middle Earth game. So stay tuned for that. I know you guys will enjoy it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show. You're keeping these shows in production. All I ask, guys, is a buck an episode, so if that's not out of your price range, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site, or you can go to the uh, mattchat.us site. There's a lot of different ways you can support the show there. I remember uh, tweeting about the show, uh, sharing it on Facebook, uh, giving it a thumbs up, whatever it is you do uh, to support Matt Chat. I really appreciate it, and thank you very much for that support. All right, what about that news for the Matt Cave? All right, so first up, some great news from Shane Stacks. There is a sale going on right now. At a good old gangs, a uh, good old games, uh, gog.com. That's a few days into this. I think it was uh, last a week though. So hopefully you'll watch this video in time to take advantage of the sale. Uh, some of these are up to 90% off. Uh, they've got all kinds of titles. Uh, the Divine Divinity games are up there. Torment, Tides of Numenera is up there. I saw the uh, the Legend of Grimrock games, which not a lot of people talk about those. But if you haven't played them, I highly recommend them. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, they're only five and eight bucks respectively. Uh, they got Dungeon Rats on there. That was a great one. And uh, Lords of Shulama uh, is, is on there as well. It's in the uh, Wasteland 2 Director's Cut. And they got a couple of variations of it, but this one is uh, $19.99. So uh, definitely worth checking out. You know, sometimes you forget about a game and some time goes by, <laughs> which is great. So if you uh, forgot about them, uh, you can go back and get them for a really good deal now. So uh, just remember uh, that sale is only about a week long. I think it's probably only about five days left as of this uh, recording so uh, don't waste any time if you if you want to go check it out uh second uh, adam uh, has uh, posted his interview with becky berger heineman one of the uh favorites of uh, Matt chat and uh, his uh, video is on 
YouTube, and it's uh, his inter it's got kind of a many different parts of the show, but uh, the interview starts around the 28 minute mark and goes on for I think the rest of the show, or at least uh, over an hour long. Lots of topics there. They talk about Bard's Tale, Apple II GS, uh, fan fiction, uh, uh, what is it, a manga, all kinds of topics. I kind of lost track after a while. Uh, but anyway, it's a Becky Burger, so go check it out. And then uh, lastly, Stig wrote in about this game. This is called uh, Empire Lords of the Seagates. Uh, this is a neo-Victorian RPG in a land both familiar and bizarre. Turn-based grid uh, combat. Uh, one of the viewers, I was reading the comments on the announcement trailer, and one of the uh, viewers said he gets an Arcanum vibe from the trailer. And I, I think he's right on the money there. I definitely have that same vibe. Uh, so anyway, go check this uh, trailer out. It's on YouTube. Uh, the game is uh, from Coin Operated Games, uh, slated for release sometime later this year, coming in 2017. So uh, hopefully we'll have more information on Empire. That's E-M-P-Y-R-E -E, uh, coming up soon. All right, so what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I've got a little number, and I, you know, I'm sort of having deja vu. Maybe I've done this one before. But you know, it's about five years worth of doing these. You know, it's 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 okay if I sometimes have a repeat. Uh, anyway, it'd be fun if you, uh, <laughs> if I happen to have done this one before, and you can be the first uh, to uh, list the episode uh, where I, I do review this. I'll have to give you a little little prize of some sort. So, uh, that a little challenge for you. And uh, then again, maybe I've never done it, so could, <laughs> you could end up watching all those videos for nothing but entertainment value. Anyway, uh, this is a warlock uh, imperial stout brewed with. Uh, pumpkin and natural flavors, <laughs> you know, and you guys know how big a fan I am of uh, the Southern Tears. Uh, they got a beer called Pumpkin, which is probably the best pumpkin ale I've ever had. I always I get that whenever I can find it. It's kind of hard to find. Uh, but this is their uh, Imperial Stout version of that. Let's see. And there's a lot of information here, a lot of technical stuff. Don't usually <laughs> go into, the, into that sort of detail. Uh, it says they got pureed pumpkin in here. Well, at least one, two, three, four, five, six different kinds of hops. Wow. Let's see, color black, body full, moderate bitterness, uh, serve in a goblet. <laughs> uh, let's see, warlock, rude to enchant your palate on its own and also to counterpoint our imperial ale, Pum King. So, counterpoint the imperial ale, Pum King. So, what is. So, this is the imperial stout version. I should, uh, stand corrected on that. Master of the Underworld. Ooh, uh, dark and mysterious, the Blackwater series is <laughs> serious about high gravity. Reanimate your senses with Warlock's huge roasted malt character, moderate carbonation, and spicy pumpkin pie aroma. Well. <laughs> Warlock. Well, anyway. <laughs> you know, I haven't even had any yet. Uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Warlock here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> that. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, this is the best ale I have ever had. <laughs> <laughs> inhaled. I mean, this aroma on this is utterly fantastic. Ah, wow. I mean, it's just, it's just like they said, it's that pumpkin pie, that's, that sort of hits the nose first, but then you get that wonderful, uh, the sort, this, those sort of imperial stout aromas, which I would say kind of chocolatey, coffee-like, uh, a lot of cherry, sort of a bourbon-y, smoky uh, aroma, but really that pumpkin is there uh, just to bring everything together. I mean, this is fantastic. Oh, wow, this is, you know, I wish you guys could smell this. You really have to, have to uh, hunt this down, Warlock. Well, you're not going to wear this as a cologne. <laughs> anyway, if this tastes even a, a quarter as good as it smells, this is going to be a five star. Uh, but let's give it a taste. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the taste, you taste more of the chocolatey uh, flavor first. That's sort of a little bit of a bourbon, a little bit of a oaky, sort of smoky flavor. And then the pumpkin sort of sort of comes in there at the, at the end. You know, you think the pumpkin would, would be uh, first in line, but it's sort of in the back. Uh, let me try it again. Oh, 
Yes, look. Now you can definitely tell this has some alcohol in it. Now let's see, what is uh what does this have? Does it they list the percentage? Ten uh, percent. <laughs> yeah, so you definitely uh, can tell there's some alcohol in this. It's sort of the the first taste you get, sort of a chocolatey cherry, like chocolate covered cherries, or those little uh, cherries, like the little rum, uh, little rum chocolates, maybe something like that, sort of going down. And then that that goes away, and then you got sort of this uh, wonderful pumpkin pie uh, flavor that comes in uh, after that, which is a really nice finish. I'll try it again. Yeah, so this is it's definitely smooth. Uh, I will say it's not for if you don't like the taste of alcohol, you probably want to stay away from this. Uh, you can definitely tell that this uh, packs a bit of a punch. Now the pumpkin, I don't remember what that has. It's it's pretty high as well, but this one just really. Uh, I mean, that's what an imperial stout is for, right? A really strong ale. So they sort of nailed that. Uh, I'd be very careful with this with this one. You probably don't want to chug this, uh, but I really enjoy it. I'll try it one more time. I'm trying not to compare it too much to pumpkin because. Uh, you know, what could compare? Uh, yeah, this is a, this kind of tastes a little bit more chocolatey, I think, than the pumpkin, which would make a perfect sense. Uh, you know, just on its own, I would go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, compared to the pumpkin, the original, I'd, I'd probably go for that one instead. Uh, but you know, if you like a little bit more uh, punch, if you want to have a bit more of a chocolatey taste. Uh, I think this would be uh, more your speed, and it's definitely got a cool uh, label on it. So anyway, five out of five on its own. Uh, if it was a choice between this and a pumpkin, I'd probably go pumpkin. But anyway, it's a really, really good ale. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking at for quotes about program testing, because I really was intrigued by what uh, Bob was saying about it in this uh, interview. And I found this quote. This is from uh, the Dutch computer scientist Edsger Dijkstra goes something like this. Program testing can show the presence of bugs, but it can never show their absence. So ponder on that and see you guys next week. the years that we have known each other, has there been any time that I have ever given you cause or reason to suspect my sanity?